Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question comes from Dewey Sita again. Hi again, Dewey. Dewey says, what's the meaning of for good? I've heard stay for good, here for good, nothing for good, but I didn't clearly understand them. Yeah, great question. For good means forever, or it means for a very long time. So like, he's here for good, or we're gonna stay for good. Your last example, nothing for good? I'm not sure, I've never seen that expression before, so I'm not quite sure about the meaning of that. But for good means forever. So I hope that that helps you. Thanks for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Byron. Hi, Byron. Byron says, hi Alicia, my question is, do you recommend using apps to practice speaking? I was using this method and I just found people from another country whose accent is different from the American accent. Thanks. Um, I think that this kind of thing really depends a lot on the app you're using. There are many different apps that you can use to study many different things. So I don't know that I can suggest like apps are great or apps are bad. It really depends on the app that you're using. So if you're not happy with the conversation partners that you found on the app you're using now, try a different app. If you're having trouble finding a partner that you really connect with or that works really well with you, another thing you can try doing is just recording yourself speaking and comparing that to a native speaker. So you could use just your phone to do this, like record yourself saying the same thing as a native speaker said. So if you watch our videos, for example, you could listen to something I said or something like Davey or Michael said, and then try to say that again and record yourself saying it and then compare it. Um, just to kind of get an idea of where you can improve. This is actually a really interesting exercise, I think, because when you are speaking, you think you sound a certain way, and then when you hear yourself, you sound really, really different. So this can actually be a really good way to practice. Um, another thing, I know that on our website, we have another uh, voice recording function where you can compare yourself to a native speaker, um, and that's specifically on the English Class 101 website. So that's another tool you can check out. Um, but for apps, yeah, like I said, I think it really depends on your conversation partner and what other services the app might offer you. So you could just try out a few different things and see what you like. So I hope this answer helps you and I hope maybe you found another technique you can use to work on improving your speaking skills. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move along to your next question. Next question comes from Henrique Ferreira. Hi, Henrique. Henrique says, hey, Alicia, I love your videos. Um, today my question is about chatbot. In the beginning, I was very shy about chatting with other people in English. I'm not anymore. But I want to know if chatting with chatbots is a good tool for improving your speaking skills. What do you think? Um, I think something like this could be good maybe for improving your basic um, like sentence building skills. I'm not sure what kind of chatbot you're talking about. To my knowledge, I've seen chatbots um, where you can type things to a chatbot and the computer will return an answer to you. Maybe you're talking about a speaking kind of chatbot, so um, that could be possible, I don't know. Um, but I would say that these sorts of things could perhaps be useful for like making basic sentences or making very simple conversations. Um, so perhaps in the very beginning, something like that could be a nice addition, a nice supplement to whatever you're doing. Um, but I think you're going to miss out on a lot of other really important stuff if you only use a robot to practice. Um, a robot is not going to do the ums and uhs and use um, interesting vocabulary words. The robot is just programmed to do one thing. So if you can remember that and maybe use it as like a method of refreshing yourself every once in a while, perhaps. Um, but I just think that you're missing out on a lot of things if you're only using a robot. I think as soon as possible you should be practicing speaking with other real people so that you understand really and truly how people use the language um, and then you can also be learning from them. So I would probably not recommend relying too much on a chatbot 
for your studies. I think the purpose of learning a language is to be able to communicate with someone else in that language. So if you only use it to communicate with a robot, then it's kind of defeating the purpose of your studies. So I would say use it with other people as much as possible and try not to use a chat bot that much. So I hope that that helps you. Thanks for an interesting question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Olesia. Hi, Olesia. Olesia says, hi, Alicia. What future form should we use when arranging official appointments or events in the future? For example, which is correct? The interview will be held on August 9th at 10 a.m. Moscow time, right? Or the interview is on August 9th at 10 a.m. Moscow time, right? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. So actually, both of the example sentences you sent are polite and they are correct. However, if you want to always be sure to sound professional and polite, use the passive form. So you use the interview will be held. That sounds a lot more professional. So the reason that a passive form is preferred when making arrangements in like formal events or like in an interview situation is because we don't always know exactly the person who's going to be doing that event. So in the case of an interview, for example, you may not know exactly who is going to be giving the interview, who is going to lead the interview. Um, so instead saying the interview will be held uh, is much better, it's much softer. Remember, we use passive voice when we don't know the person doing the action or when the person doing the action is not important. So this is really useful in like business situations and other formal events when the activity is the thing that needs the focus, not necessarily the person or the people doing the activity. So um, it's better to use the passive form here. You can use the active form. So like for example, um, you're having the interview at 9 a.m., right? So there's nothing incorrect about that, but using you can sound really direct there. And you might run into some problems where maybe the person you're contacting is not the person giving the interview. So using the passive voice avoids that. So in conclusion for this, really if you're ever kind of in a formal situation or a business situation and you have this kind of question, try to use the passive voice instead of the active voice. That's a pretty good rule of thumb to follow. I hope that this helps you. Thanks very much for an interesting question. Let's move along to your next question. Next question comes from Carlos Cordoba. Hi, Carlos. Carlos says, I always struggle with the use of in and on. For example, when I'm referring to a quote that I read in a book, should I say you can find it on page number or in page number? Also, how do I use it for locations? For example, when should I use in or on or at? Yeah, prepositions are always a tough point. As a quick regular reminder, we do have a couple of prepositions videos on the channel. These are good introductions to prepositions of place and prepositions of time. Regarding your question, your specific question though, um, when you're talking about books, we'll say read it in a book, in a book. When you're talking about something that's um, on a page, we use on, on a page. If you want to get even more specific and talk about a line of text, we say in a line of text. So the reasons that we use these prepositions, uh, first, the in preposition for a book. When you imagine a physical book, uh, like a cover, two covers, and then the contents are inside it, the contents of the book are enclosed by the covers. So we imagine we have to open a book and go inside the book to find things. So we use in for the contents of books. We use on for pages. So you can kind of imagine a book as being like two layers almost. There's the paper and then there are the words. So the words are on top of the paper, kind of like on the surface of the paper. So we use on to talk about things that are on the page, the things that are above the paper. Then we use in to talk about lines because we're looking for something like specific um, inside one line or two lines of text. So it's within like line number three or line number four. So some examples. In the book Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, there's a mistake on page seven in line five. 
that's not true. So I hope that this helps you understand when to use in and on. And again, I would recommend starting with the videos on the channel for information, some more information about other prepositions. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from NHI Ni. Hello, hi Ni. Uh, Ni says, do wild animal and wildlife have the same meaning? No, they have very similar meanings though. So first, wildlife is one word, it's a noun, it's an uncountable noun. Wildlife means all the living things that are not humans. So that's um, like animals and fish and lizards. So it's like all the creatures in an area that are not human. That's the wildlife in an area. Examples. Let's go to the wildlife park. We need to protect the wildlife in this area. Wild animal, however, is a phrase. Wild is an adjective. Animal is a noun. So a wild animal is an animal that has not been domesticated. Domesticated means trained. So for example, a pet cat or a pet dog is a domesticated animal. That's an animal that has been trained. So a wild animal is something that does not have training. Some examples. Did you see any wild animals on your camping trip? The news said a hiker was attacked by a wild animal. So thanks very much for the question. I hope that that helps you. All right, that's everything that I have for you for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. I wanted you to give us a list of possible wild animals. Bears, wolves, oh, antelopes, wow. lions, tigers, cougars, um, jaguars, rats, mice, a whale. A crab is a wild animal. Stray dog. Deer, rabbits, coyotes, uh, squirrels. <laughs> and must know autumn vocabulary words. Autumn, let's go. Sweater. The first word is sweater. Sweater, that's that long sleeve, often knit garment that you wear. Maybe your grandma has given you a few over the course of your life. A sweater, it is a very, very, it's like the quintessential. Quintessential means like the regular, the expected, the like the of course item for autumn. So in a sentence, my favorite sweater is wool. It's warm. In this sentence, I got spaghetti sauce on my favorite sweater. Oh, I've done that. I've done that. Everybody has done that. Everybody, surely. Okay. Windy. 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 So strong winds uh, in autumn, I suppose, in some cases. Windy. Um, in a sentence, if it's windy in autumn, you should go fly a kite. In this sentence, I can handle the cold, but I hate when it's windy. Mm, for sure. Okay. Cool. Cool. Cool in this case refers to the weather. So it's not quite cold, but it's not warm either. It's cool. It's cool. We also might use the word brisk. So it's not cold. It's like that kind of like refreshing. There's a little like feeling in brisk. I don't know what that means. <laughs> That's how I feel on a brisk day. I'm like, yeah. Um, no, but cool, cool, cool is kind of, it's not quite cold. The difference between cool and brisk, cool is kind of a mild feeling, mild type of weather. Brisk has a little bit of like bite. There's a little like freshness to it. Cool is very mild, I think. Uh, in a sentence, I love going to the park on cool autumn days. In this sentence, these cool, sunny days are my favorite time of the year. <laughs> this is cool. All right. Autumn. The next word, of course, is autumn. Autumn, also known as fall. Both are okay to use. Autumn is that uh, season in your country, depending on where you live in the world, where trees will change color. Uh, the weather goes from hot to less hot. It uh, goes from hot to cool. People start wearing sweaters or maybe like, I don't know, just the temperature starts to drop a little bit after, after summer when it's warm. So you can use autumn or fall, both are fine. In a sentence, autumn is my favorite season. That's true. Here, uh, autumn is my favorite season because of the weather. Indeed. Cold. The next word is cold. Cold. Cold is the uncomfortable feeling. You f it's just too, the temperature is too low, you feel uncomfortable. It's cold. So in a sentence, I, like cold days because I can drink hot chocolate. 
And this sentence, I can't stand the cold. I'm moving to Hawaii. Chestnut. Uh, the next word is chestnut. Chestnut is a food that you can eat. It is a type of nut. It is a thing that you eat in autumn. You can roast them. They smell kind of nice. You can put them on dessert. You use all kinds of things with them. Uh, so in a sentence, you can make lots of desserts with chestnuts. In the sentence, oh, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. This is a popular, this is the opening line, the opening lyric to a popular holiday song. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Okay. Falling leaves. The next expression is falling leaves. In autumn, leaves change color and they start to fall off of the tree. So falling leaves is kind of an image of autumn or an image of fall. Um, there's kind of that, that nice image of those beautiful like gold and red leaves falling. So in a sentence, let's rake the falling leaves up and jump in them. The falling leaves reminded me of bittersweet memories. Oh gosh, onward. Thanksgiving. Oh, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. We've done a couple of videos about Thanksgiving, so if you like, I'm sure somebody will put a link like here, 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 I don't know. Thanksgiving is and let's see, I know we have this holiday in the U.S. I believe Canada also has a Thanksgiving, though I'm not familiar with the date. Uh, Thanksgiving in the U.S. is celebrated in November, and we eat food together with our families, a huge uh, turkey usually, and some other autumn foods too. In a sentence, Thanksgiving is great, but I always eat too much. That's true. Uh, this sentence says, Thanksgiving is the busiest traveling time of the year. I didn't know that. I wonder if that's true. Halloween. The next one is Halloween. Halloween. I love Halloween, or at least I loved Halloween when I was younger. Um, <laughs> these days it's like, all right, yeah, you have your fun. Halloween is a really fun holiday where you can dress up as a character, you can dress up as somebody else or a creature, a monster, whatever. When you're children, you can go out and get candy from the people in your neighborhood. As an adult, there are lots of fun parties to go to as well. Halloween. Uh, in a sentence, I was once in a flash mob for Halloween. That is true. In this sentence, this Halloween, I'm going to dress up as a spooky ghost. Spooky means scary, but not like super scary. Spooky is like cute scary. That's spooky. Leaf. Okay, leaf. Uh, the last word is leaf. A leaf. A leaf is that thing that's on a, that grows on a tree. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it looks like this. <laughs> I don't know. There are many different kinds of leaves. Uh, you might find them falling en masse from trees. You might find them scattered on your streets during autumn. Point. The plural of leaf is not leaves, but leaves. So in a sentence, uh, ginkgo leaves smell really bad when they fall. That is true. They smell really bad. Um, this sentence says, she stepped on the leaves on the sidewalk. Five sentence patterns that you can use as a beginner of English. Let's go. The first expression that you can use as a beginner is personally, I think that, or I would just use, I think that. Personally makes it sound a little bit more polite, I think. You can use this to introduce an opinion. For example, personally, I think that pizza is amazing. Personally, I think that dinosaurs would have been delicious. <laughs> personally, I think that cars should be made to enjoy with friends. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna end it there. Personally, I think that you shouldn't worry about it. Yes, that's probably a much more useful sentence than dinosaurs would be delicious. <laughs> the next expression is what does blah 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 mean? So where here is the word you don't know. So for example, what does pasta mean? What does stegosaurus mean. So a word like stegosaurus is a really strange word that you probably don't know. Stegosaurus is a type of dinosaur. We're on a very dinosaur, I don't know, it Jurassic. we're on a Jurassic adventure at the moment. So this is a pattern you use when you don't know, uh, when you don't know the meaning of the word and you would like someone to explain it to you. So if you say, what does stegosaurus mean? Then someone can say, oh, it's a dinosaur. It's kind of like, sh it's a sort of short guy and it has a bunch of spikes on its back and it has a long tail and it gets into a fight with a Tyrannosaurus Rex if you saw the movie Fantasia by Disney. Okay. <laughs> so in this sentence, what does complication mean? Mm, means problem. Okay. The next pattern you can use is, can you tell me more about blah, blah, blah. So on a topic that you would like more information about, you can say, can you tell me more about the soccer game last week? Can you tell me more about the 
plan for the party next week. So something you would like more information about, you can say, "Can you tell me more about this thing?" Okay. So in a sentence, "Can you tell me more about your sandwich options?" That is a useful sentence. Very useful. That is a useful sentence. Okay. In this sentence here,、uh, we don't have that back home. Can you tell me more about it?、Mm, this is used the reverse pattern.、Hmm. Okay.、Uh, the next expression is "if it were up to me." If it were up to me. Ah,、oh, I had to teach this in a class a couple weeks ago, actually. If it were up to me means if I could make the decision. If this was my. If this were my decision.、Uh, Blah blah blah. So, meaning, if I could make the choice, this is what I would do. But one point here is the nuance is it is not my decision. This is not my decision. But if it were my decision, I would do blah blah blah. So, for example, if it were up to me, every day would be Saturday. Woo woo woo. But it's not right. So.、Um, That's that's always the underlying. That's always the kind of basic、um, nuance of this phrase. Some this decision is not mine. Okay, here the example is: If it were up to me, I would take my boss to dinner. Oh my! <laughs> Things just got scandalous. <laughs> the next pattern is: I feel like blah blah blah. You can use "I feel like" when you introduce、uh, a suggestion or something that you would like to do, especially for food, drinks, or activities. So, for example, "I feel like coffee." "I feel like Italian food." "I feel like an action movie." There's some activity or something you would like to do at the end of this pattern. "I feel like bowling this afternoon." Something needs to go here. Some sort of activity.、Um, of course. You can use this expression to talk about your feelings. I feel like something, but this something must be a noun. It must be a noun. Like if you feel really great, I feel like a million bucks, for example. If you feel really bad, I feel like garbage. <laughs> That's a nice expression that somehow just came out of my head. Anyway. Um, you can use this in two ways, but this must be completed with a noun phrase at the end of the sentence. When learning a new language, it's easy to think, "I don't think I'm making any progress. What if I never reach my goals?" We all get these thoughts from time to time, but are they worth being scared of? What are the fears language learners tend to have the most, and how can you learn to overcome them? Here are the top four language learning fears according to our users. Number one, I'm not good enough to start speaking yet. This is a pretty common fear or misconception that most learners have. Here's how you overcome it. The best way to get good at speaking is to start speaking from day one. You need to open your mouth and just start talking. If you think you're not good enough, just focus on the lines you want to say. Number two, I'm afraid I'll never be fluent. You've got to set small, specific goals. Make daily goals, like having just a five-minute conversation. As these small goals add up, you'll be speaking more comfortably. Number three, I'm not making any progress. There are two things you can do right now. Use the dashboard to track your progress. Our dashboard shows how much you've accomplished. Or try a harder lesson on our website. The lessons come with line-by-line -line translations, and the hosts explain everything. Now you can understand something you didn't minutes ago. Number four, I'm afraid of not understanding anything I hear. This fear can occur when you hear advanced grammar and vocabulary, and it just goes completely over your head. To beat this, simply read along with our line-by-line -line tool. It's the best way to instantly understand advanced conversations. Translations and scripts are right in front of you. For real-life situations, learn useful phrases such as "Can you say it more slowly?" "I don't understand." There's nothing wrong with saying that you didn't understand something. So these are the top four fears and how to overcome them. Luckily, we also have the perfect tools available to help you conquer your fears. Sign up for your free lifetime account, no credit card required, and you'll get the best free online resources. Don't let your fears stop you. Start learning now. Want to speak real English from your first lesson?
Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. How to curse like an English native speaker. Piss, a slang term for urine. For example, don't piss your pants. You can say this when you're really scared or anxious. For example, if you're about to go on stage to make a speech or perform, someone can say, don't piss your pants. You can do it. Pissed off, to be really angry. When I'm angry, I can say, hey, I'm really pissed off at you right now. Why did you do that for? Loser, used to describe an uncool person. In high school, my friends and I would use this a lot and we would say, hey loser, how's it going? Idiot, used to insult people by saying they're not intelligent. Of all the mean things that you can say, this is on the lighter side, but people still use it. Shoot, this is used to show disappointment or frustration without using a stronger curse word. Shoot, I spilled my coffee. Shut up. You can use this when you want them to be quiet or there's something surprising that you just heard. You can say, shut up, no way. Ticked off to be really angry. You can say this with pissed off. So this is actually an older term. Not many people use this as much anymore because most people actually just use pissed off. Fool, this is similar to saying someone is like a clown. You can say, you're acting like a fool right now. Jerk, this is a light insult used to describe someone who is mean. For example, if there's someone bullying another person, that person is being a jerk. Wimp, this means someone who isn't strong. There is a movie out right now called Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Have you seen it? Have you not? I haven't yet. Top 10 English slang words. Let's begin. Creepy, this is used to say that someone makes you uncomfortable. Teacher's pet. This is used as an insult to classmates who try too hard to impress the teacher or for someone who is especially liked by a teacher. Scaredy cat, an insult for people who are easily scared. Tattletale, a person who tells authority figures information in order to get someone in trouble. Nerd, a person who is smart but not cool. Ginger, this is an insult for people with red hair. Bimbo, used as an insult for women who aren't smart. Jock, used as an insult for men who are into sports and aren't smart. Show off, someone who takes every opportunity to display their talent. Clown, used to say that someone is silly. Top 10 language learning strategies. Let's begin. Befriending or dating someone who speaks English watching movies or listening to music in English, read English newspapers or magazines, record your voice and compare your pronunciation with native English speakers, download dialogue tracks and listen to English conversations, repeat the phrases that you hear out loud again and again, Review all the lessons on EnglishClass101.com to master them completely. Read lines slowly at first, then reread and increase your speed. Set small and measurable learning goals with your personal deadlines. Try harder lessons to challenge yourself and improve faster. Learn eight words Americans overuse. Let's go! Definitely. I'm definitely going to call her this weekend. People use this word to mean that they will 100% do something. It can also be used to agree with someone. Unbelievable. Did you see the news this morning? It's unbelievable. You can say unbelievable when something is shocking or strange. It can also be used to express disappointment. For example, Jenny is late for dinner again. Unbelievable. Literally. I literally thought I was going to die. Usually, this word is used to emphasize something in an exaggerated way. The word sort of means that something really happened a certain way, but Americans usually use this word to exaggerate. Hilarious. Everyone thinks my friend is hilarious, 
but he's not that funny. Hilarious is like saying something is extremely funny. It is often used to exaggerate how funny something was. Nice. That guy with the nice hair just made a nice catch. Totally. I totally love your new dress. You can use totally with a verb to show how completely you do something. For example, if you totally hate something, it means that you completely hate it. It's usually used as an exaggeration. Like. Like, I tried so hard, but like, I still failed anyway. This is a filler word that people insert into their sentences. Sort of like, um, it doesn't follow the literal meaning of the word. Seriously. I'm seriously going to tell my teacher what I really think of her class. Seriously is just a way to say you will do something, but it usually means you want to do something, but you won't really do it. Today we're going to talk about four techniques to help you stop translating in your head and instead start thinking in your target language. This will allow you to have conversations with ease, read smoothly, and better understand native speakers. These are four methods to help you think in a new language. Number one, surround yourself with your target language. This way, you'll be completely immersed in the language. Without realizing it, you'll learn pronunciation, sentence structures, grammar, and new vocabulary. Play music in the background while you're cooking, or have a radio station on while you study. Just use one of our endless podcasts available to you. These are easy to listen to in the background while doing other things. Number two, learn through observation. This is how we all learned our native languages as kids. Words will develop their own meanings that relate better to your target language, rather than meanings that are translated directly. Number three, speak out loud to yourself. Even if you're a little embarrassed, it forces you to listen to how you speak. It makes it much easier to spot simple grammar mistakes. Number four, practice daily. If you practice everything for only one day, you won't retain the information you learned. The brain can realistically only focus for about 30 minutes. So studying a little every day allows you to absorb better. Follow these steps and have patience. You'll soon be able to achieve your language learning goals. Just make sure to remember these four methods. 10 ways to help improve your pronunciation. This is gonna be a good one, I think. So let's go. Sing along to a favorite song. All right, so the first tip for improving your pronunciation is to sing along to a favorite song. So if you, uh, I should add though, this favorite song should be in your target language. So if you're studying English, pick a favorite English song and sing along to that song. Uh, or try to sing to the song just from memory too. So singing along to your favorite song can help you with pronunciation, can help you with the rhythm sometimes of uh, the language you're trying to learn. So it can be really fun and it can be a good way to practice your pronunciation. In a sentence, I like singing along to my favorite songs. Read out loud. The next tip for your pronunciation is to read out loud. So. Uh, reading out loud, you can choose something that's interesting for you in, your, in English, if English is the language you're studying. So pick something, maybe it's a news article, or maybe it's a book uh, you're interested in, maybe there's an author you're interested in. Find something in your target language in English and try reading it out loud. So don't just read in your mind, uh, but read the words out loud, speak them, so that you can get comfortable pronouncing those words. Uh, and you can try reading uh, the same passage or the same sentence multiple times to make it smoother. Uh, so this can be a really good tip um, for, and it, it, I think it also improves uh, your natural uh, ability to pick up grammar too, because if you're reading something like in a book, for example, you can kind of pick up the natural rhythm of grammar and you also slowly get a feeling for the correct ways um, that words should connect together. So this I think is a really good tip. In a sentence, I sometimes read out loud to practice pronunciation. That's true. Repeat lines you hear in TV shows. The next tip is to repeat lines you hear or the words you hear in TV shows or movies, things like that. So um, this means not only words, don't only repeat 
single vocabulary words. Yes, maybe you find a vocabulary word that is really interesting,、um, or it sounds funny, or something like that. But by repeating、uh, a full sentence or a full line. In a TV show or in a movie, you're putting the words together. So not just one word, but making a whole sentence. So feeling kind of the flow of your language that you're studying.、Um, so this can be a better way to actually practice making sentences and repeating sentences instead of just words. So you can repeat after characters in TV shows. I sometimes do this when I'm like watching Japanese TV. I'm like ah, and then I try and spit it back out. It's hard to do sometimes when it's like the first time you've heard a word or the first time you've heard a grammar point,、um, but you can still understand that sentence. It's interesting, so try to say it.、Uh, it's kind of fun, actually. I think. In a sentence, try repeating lines from TV shows to practice. Practice speaking in phrases, not single vocabulary words. The next tip, this is very similar to my TV show tip, is to practice speaking in phrases, not in vocabulary words, not just single vocabulary words. Even if you're not repeating lines from TV shows, when you practice speaking, don't just speak in nouns. So sometimes, for example,、uh, I'll hear people just use noun, like they'll use a noun and maybe a verb,、uh, like I tomorrow beach, something like that. And yes, we can probably guess based on that how, like the the meaning, the speaker's meaning. But、uh, you need to practice making a whole sentence. So yes, you know those words, I tomorrow and beach, and the listener can probably guess what you mean. But you need to practice all those little words in the middle, like、uh, like I'm going to the beach tomorrow. So make a full sentence. Practice making full sentences. Don't only practice single vocabulary words. Make the whole line. It's really good. Sometimes I think my students get irritated. Like they'll, I, like I force them to practice full sentences. Like so, I'll say like,、uh, mm, Have you ever been to Germany? And they'll say yes. I'm like. Okay, for the purposes of practice, <laughs> can you make a full sentence? And they'll say, "I have been to Germany."、Mm. Like that's an extreme example, but like I try to push that, you know, making the full sentence. It's it's silly sometimes, but just trying to do that. <laughs> okay,、uh, so in a sentence, speaking in entire phrases is helpful for practicing the rhythm of a new language. Speak a lot with your teacher and ask them to be strict with you. Onwards. Okay. So the next tip is to speak a lot with your teacher and ask them to be strict with you. So this is kind of two tips in one. One, speak with your teacher.、Uh, so if you have a teacher,、um, make sure you're speaking in their class. If you, if, if wherever possible. Sometimes I'll have students join my class and maybe they feel shy or whatever. Um, and they don't speak very much, but please speak with your teacher so that your teacher can correct you. Your teacher can give you, at least if they're a native speaker, or maybe even if they aren't a native speaker, your teacher can give you corrections.、Uh, and if you don't speak, your teacher cannot help you in most cases. So please speak with your teacher. And if you like, you can tell them, please be strict about my pronunciation.、Uh, so sometimes people will say, please help me with my pronunciation specifically, and then I can stop them every time they make a mistake, and we practice that sound,、uh, especially th sounds like the th, like using.、Um, Using your mouth a little bit differently can be really uncomfortable for some people. But、uh, if your teacher can point out those things, like th sounds, the, this, that, these, those, those th sounds, ending er sounds,、um, practicing those with your teacher can be a really good way to work on your pronunciation.、Mm. So in a sentence, speak a lot with your teacher. They can correct you and help you improve. Try recording yourself speaking and play it back. The next tip for practicing your pronunciation is to try recording yourself speaking and listen to it. Play it back and listen to it. So this it might sound a little bit strange, but、um, when we're speaking, maybe we don't hear certain things that certain maybe、uh, our little idiosyncrasies or the little special things that we do when we speak. Maybe we don't hear them as we speak, but when we listen to ourselves later. We notice them. So, for example, when I watch this video, when I watch any of these videos, I notice little things that I didn't notice、um, 
at now <laughs> when I'm filming the video. So the same can apply to your pronunciation. When you listen to yourself speak, you might hear something that you don't notice when you're speaking. So this can be a good way to um, to kind of remove yourself, to, to go outside your body a little bit and listen to yourself from the listener's perspective. So this might be a tip to try. In a sentence, sometimes you hear yourself more clearly on a recording. Do shadowing exercises. All right, the next tip for pronunciation is to do shadowing exercises. So a shadowing exercise, uh, there are textbooks and, and I think resources on the web, maybe on the website. Um, actually, I think you could use the website. Any uh, English listening or anything in your target language, when you listen to that, as the speaker is speaking, you quickly repeat back what the speaker is saying. So as you're listening to it, you repeat it almost immediately. So you're trying to uh, to match their pronunciation as closely, as accurately as possible. This is called a shadowing exercise. So um, I've seen some cases where people or textbooks will recommend doing, you know, 15 minutes of shadowing each day or something like that. Or maybe you can do a shadowing exercise uh, listening to a podcast or listening to the news or uh, something you might find on uh, the website here. So that's a really good way to work on your pronunciation and to get familiar with using those sounds um, kind of more naturally, the way a native speaker would. So this can be a good tip to improve your pronunciation. In a sentence, uh, try shadowing a native speaker to improve your pronunciation chat with native speakers. Uh, so yeah, the next tip is to chat with native speakers. So chatting with native speakers, of course, uh, is a great way, A, to make friends, uh, B, to pick up new vocabulary, C, to get familiar with grammar and slang, um, but also it can help your pronunciation. Not all native speakers speak with exactly the same pronunciation. So you might hear slight differences depending on the country, depending on the region in a country a native speaker comes from. So there are many different kinds of pronunciations, uh, or many diff there are many different pronunciations, but uh, when you chat with native speakers, you can kind of understand the different pronunciations that are out there. Uh, and maybe it can help you um, be more consistent in your presentation, in your pronunciation too. So this could be a good way um, to improve your pronunciation, but of course it's important in general for learning a language, I think. In a sentence, chatting with native speakers is an important part of learning a language. Do pronunciation drills. The next tip is to do pronunciation drills. So if you know that there's a sound, if you know that there's something that you always struggle with, try drilling it. So dr a drill, to drill something means to repeat a lot. So you might hear this word used for like uh, like sports and fitness, like you drill a skill, you, which means to practice something a lot and intensively. So if you know that there's like the TH sound is really difficult for you, maybe take 10 minutes and do a pronunciation drill on those sounds for you know, every day for a month or something. So if you know that there's a specific sound that's difficult for you, consider trying just some very specific pronunciation drills. Um, so um, that can mean just making that sound repeatedly or maybe reading a text um, out loud that has a lot of that kind of pronunciation. Um, I think you can find a few different ways to drill, to practice intensively those parts uh, of pronunciation that are difficult for you. So, in a sentence, try doing pronunciation drills for the sounds you have trouble making. Find words that are particularly interesting to you. So, uh, I think maybe this is the last tip, uh, is to find words that are particularly interesting to you. So, maybe there's a word that sounds really funny, or maybe you found a really long word in English, or a really interesting word, a word that has an interesting history, Whatever, if you can find words that are interesting to you, um, then maybe you can put some extra emphasis on pronouncing them correctly. So if you're actually enjoying the words that you're learning, um, then I think it'll become more important for you to express that accurately in your speech. And so focusing on those words maybe, um, and, and in pronouncing those words correctly, perhaps that can help you apply that same pronunciation in this interesting word 
maybe the pronunciation uh, of that word or some of the parts of that word, you can find that in other words in other places throughout your target language. So uh, if you enjoy a particular word and focus on uh, expressing that word, pronouncing that word accurately, it can help you maybe apply that pronunciation in other parts of the language. So give it a try. In a sentence, take extra care to pronounce words of particular interest correctly. Hi everyone, it's Chang from Elight, and next to me is Alisha from English Class 101. This is our second video we are doing with Alisha and English Class 101. Hi everybody, I'm Alisha from EnglishClass101.com. Thanks so much for having me on Elight Chang. It's great <laughs> to be a part of your video. Oh, and what is the topic today? Today we're going to talk about the top five mistakes that English learners make. Let's so, go! <laughs> let's start! <laughs> the position of adjectives. So the first mistake to talk about today mm -hmm. is the position of adjectives. What do you mean like the position of mm. adjectives? Do your students make mistakes with this? Let me think. Very often I heard my students say that this is a house beautiful. So have you ever heard that before? Yeah, actually my students are Japanese. They often make the same mistake because the word order in Japanese uses the noun first and then the adjective. Oh yeah, the same in Vietnamese because people usually translate from our mother language mm -hmm. to English. Mm -hmm. So in Vietnam we have nhà means uh, house okay. and that means beautiful. And then we translate it, we have nhà đẹp means house, beautiful. Mm -hmm. But actually it's, it's incorrect, right? Right. So what is the right order, the right position of adjective? Yeah, so we should put the adjective before the noun. So in this example sentence, beautiful house is correct. It should be, this is a beautiful house, mm -hmm. right? Can you explain that? Well, I mean, there are some phrases that are just, we just use the same kind of patterns for them. So mm -hmm. using just a simple adjective and a noun together, whatever the adjective, or maybe there are more adjectives we want to use, like in this example of a beautiful house, or you, I think you said like <laughs> a red house, for example, yeah, yeah. we should put the adjectives together before the noun always. Like that's a beautiful red house. House. Yeah, normally sometimes I hear some students say that a dress, red, long. Mm. When you want to describe their dress, actually, what is the correct one? Right. So in the same, in the same as we saw mm -hmm. with the first example sentence, we should put the adjectives before the noun. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I think it was long and red. Yeah. Yeah, that's a long red dress. A long red dress. Mm -hmm. It should be the correct one, right? That's correct. Yeah. 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 So everyone make sure to put the adjective in front of the noun. The order of personal pronouns, you and I, or I and you. Good, okay, so the next mistake to talk about is the order of personal pronouns. So mm -hmm. an example of this is like, you and I, or I and you. Yeah, it's very funny for this because many people just say, um, I and somebody mm -hmm. do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I heard that a lot, a lot in Vietnam. So have you heard that in Japan? I see. Yes, I have heard <laughs> yeah. that. Like I and Chang are <laughs> making a video. Yeah. It's like, mm, not quite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've yeah, heard that yeah. too. So it's a not correct one, right? That's right. That's right. It's not correct. So we should say Chang and I are making a video. That's the correct sentence here. So in your opinion, mm -hmm. what could be the reason uh, for this mistake? Uh, the reason for the mistake. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a trip. Well, it depends on the country. For your <laughs> students, I would imagine it's perhaps a word order issue for Vietnamese um, yeah, students. Because mm -hmm. in Vietnamese, we usually say tôi và. It means I and mm -hmm. somebody. When you are in a situation where you're doing something with other people, it does sound kind of strange to say <laughs> uh, I and you or I and Chang did something. So as you're saying, I think it's better to put I at the end. Mm. Okay, so when you want to put yourself in a list with the others, remember to put yourself at last. For example, I would say Alisa and I are making a video. It's going to be perfect one. Mm, exactly. Sounds good. Confusion over active and passive voice. 
And the next mistake will be the confusion over active and passive voice. Mm, this is a really common one, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you have an example of how this works? Um, yes, of course, because it's a very common mistake. For example, in Vietnam, people sometimes say, uh, I was went out with my friends yesterday. That's a perfect example of, <laughs> like, it's better to use just a simple active voice to explain that. I went out with my friends yesterday. Yeah, it should be, I went out with my friends yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's because in this case, it's the active voice, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. It's not passive. It's not passive in this case. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, okay. I've heard another example of it, like something, just a simple action, like an everyday action, like uh, in passive voice, uh, the door was opened by my teacher, ah. for example. Uh. It's like a sentence like that, we can understand the sentence, mm -hmm. but it doesn't need to be in passive. Yeah, in and it's case. not natural, right? That's right. Yeah, we should yeah. say that my teacher opened the door. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. natural and it's easier to communicate, I think. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking like, how do I know? When should I use active voice? When should I use passive voice? When you want to uh, express like the person doing the action is not so important or you don't know who did the action. Like for example, if your phone was <laughs> stolen. Yeah, yeah. But we don't know who, yeah. who stole the phone, so we don't use know. Passive voice. Use passive voice mm -hmm. then, yeah. yeah. Or if that person is not important, mm -hmm. use passive voice. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And sometimes if you try to translate from your mother language to uh, into English, so um, don't try to translate what by words. So another daily life example could be like maybe uh, my mother cooking dinner, for example. Mm -hmm. So I could say uh, my mother cooked dinner in the active voice, mm -hmm. or dinner was cooked by my mother. In that sentence, in the active sentence, it's clear who is the person who mm -hmm. cooked dinner. It's my mother, like mm -hmm. she's the important part here. <laughs> yeah. If I say dinner was cooked by my mother. So dinner is more important exactly, than my mother. <laughs> exactly, so it sounds not so nice. So dinner was cooked by my I mother. I love my mother a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. So it's like, yeah. we should say uh, my mother cooked dinner. That's a much ah, better choice. Yeah, yeah, so for daily use, we should you Active voice. Mm, mm. Active voice is very nice. Mm -hmm. Incorrect use of present continuous. So number four would be incorrect use of present continuous. Mm, that's a very <laughs> common problem I've yeah, heard. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So using the continuous with a verb that we probably should not use the continuous form with. Yeah, for mm. example, if I want to say that I love my boyfriend a lot, People would say that I am loving him. Mm -hmm. I'm loving him. Normally, we just say, I love him. Mm. We don't need to put it in present continuous in this case. Or when people talk about the sports or their hobbies that they enjoy, they might say, for example, I am liking baseball. <laughs> or I am liking football, for yeah, example. Yeah. But in the same way, we should not use the continuous tense there. Let's just use the simple present tense. I like baseball. I like football. So when you're using these like mental state or emotion or mm -hmm. feeling verbs, usually we use them in the simple present tense. Mm -hmm. Of course, sometimes we use a word like thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but sometimes I still hear that people say, I'm thinking about right. something. Exactly, so, exactly. So why we use thing in Korea present continuous, mm -hmm. and in which case we don't use that in present continuous? Exactly. Well, in that case, that's a perfect mm -hmm. example using the word think in the continuous tense. That's sort of like an action. Like ah, at yeah. that moment, I'm thinking about something. That's an action in my mind. That's an action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So in that case, it's okay to use it in the continuous okay. tense. So we have to clarify the verbs is an action mm. or the verbs a kind of emotional state to mm -hmm. rate. Exactly. A status. Your example of like, <laughs> I am loving my boyfriend. It sounds a little like, mm? <laughs> like well, that's a little different. Like, yeah. but what other, what other crazy examples can we think of? <laughs> like, oh, sometimes my students say understanding. 
Ah. They use it like they say like uh, I am not understanding. Okay. <laughs> I'm like I'm like thank you. That's very helpful for me. <laughs> But you should say I don't understand. I don't mm. understand in the mm-hmm. present tense. Okay. Yeah. Alicia, so can you give us some uh, verbs mm-hmm. usually in uh, simple present, not in present mm. continuous? Yeah. So we talked about, for example, like and love, know and understand, fear, mm. uh, mm-hmm. hate. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Lot. So yeah. those very like emotion related words. Mm-hmm. Those are definitely good <laughs> okay. examples of this. So just make sure to think about your verb. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> think. Think. <laughs> think. Are you thinking about your verbs? Answering the negative questions. And the next mistake, and a very common mistake, is answering the negative question. Ah, answering negative questions. Mm-hmm. So, for example, a question that begins with a negative word, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Okay. For example, I will take an example. Okay. Yeah. For example, people will ask you, mm-hmm. "Don't you want to learn English?" Don't you? Don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Don't you want to learn English? People will say, mm, "Yes, I don't," or "No, I don't." Yes, I do. No, I do. Yeah, very confusing, <laughs> right? Actually, though, native speakers sometimes get confused mm-hmm. with this point too. Yeah. But yeah. it's good to it's good to discuss this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the correct answer to someone asking, "Don't you want to learn English?" You can say, "Yes, I do." Well. I hope you do. <laughs> If you want to learn English. If you want to learn English, uh-huh. yeah, you say yes, I do. Mm-hmm. But if you hate English, just say no, I don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think people, uh, especially native speakers, use the negative question to make the question a little more polite, or maybe to make the question a little softer. Mm-hmm. That's it. But just like you said, just think of it like a simple yes/no question. Mm-hmm. Don't you want to learn English? Do you want to learn English? We use them in the same way. Mm-hmm. They mean the same thing. So,、mm. can you give us another example? Sure, another example. Maybe a daily life example.、Mm. Yes. Let's see. Didn't you go to that party last weekend? And then you can answer with "Yes, I did." In this case, it's a past tense negative. Didn't you go to that party? So you can answer "Yes, I did" or "No, I didn't." In the same way that you would answer "Did you go to that party last weekend?" If you get confused, then、yeah. just think of it as a simple yes or no question. Replace it with do. Don't you want to learn English? If you say yes, so please visit English Class One Hundred One channel or Elite Learning English channel. We have a lot of video lesson there for you to study for free as well. And you can also check us out at English Class One Hundred One dot com, our website, where you can find、I、lots of stuff. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> So then, we're talking about these examples of these problems. But what do you think are some ways that students can learn these、mm. good word choices, these more natural word choices? Yeah, my advice would be try to use a lot of authentic materials like、um, TV series, newspaper,、uh, songs, movies. A lot, a lot to see how native speaker choose a word. Do you have anything? Is there like a favorite? Like TV show or book or something、um, that you really enjoyed that helped yeah, you. Yeah, I really enjoy Friends. Ah, you know it. I know it.、Whoa! Many people, yeah, <laughs> many people love using Friends for study, and、oh, it's、yeah. and it was such a popular show among native speakers yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great resource, and it's funny. Check it out, friends. <laughs> yeah, and if you enjoyed the video, please let us know by giving this video thumbs up and give some comments so we know you like it and it's、uh, you will give it a lot of motivation to make another video. Bye. Bye. Usually,、yeah. like the the teacher's surname, so like Mr. Johnson or like Ms. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you go? Didn't you go? Didn't you go? <laughs> Sounds a little suspicious, <laughs> right? You know, maybe you're checking your friend. Like, didn't you go to that party last weekend? <laughs> no.、Uh, Do you want to study with、okay. us? Oh, should I say it、yeah. one more time? A little less silly. Good one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody! Welcome back. My name is Alicia, and today we're going to be talking about some English tongue twisters. I'm joined again by Michael. Hey everybody. 
So today we're going to be talking about some things in English that are difficult to say. That might be difficult for you, and they're probably going to be difficult for us to explain. So let's get right into it. Michael, what is your first tongue twister? My first tongue twister is: How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? One more time, a little bit faster. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Excellent. And there is a traditional response to this one. You're familiar with the response? So Once you tell me, it's, I don't know. It's a question, right? This, this is, it ends in a question. There's a question mark on your card. And the traditional response is, it would chuck all the wood that a woodchuck could if a woodchuck could chuck wood. Ah. Yeah. I, I have it on one of my cards, actually, I think, too. This oh, was man. totally unplanned, I would like to point out. Yeah, here it is. It would chuck all the wood that a woodchuck could if a woodchuck could chuck wood. So you can, you can use this with your friends if you want. All right, let's do it real quick. Ready? Okay. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? It would chuck all the wood that a woodchuck could if a woodchuck could chuck wood. Ah. Hey, hey. All right, there's one down. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've talked about that one already, so I guess I'll go with another classic one um, that I've known since I was little. This one uses the P sound a lot. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Lots of P sounds in this one. Can you speed it up for us? Well, I don't know if I can say it in the first place. Peter Piper picked the... Fuh. <laughs> have you not heard this one before? I have it. Okay. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Hold on one more time. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. For me, it helps if you snap. Okay. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a pack. Oh my God, I can't do it. Maybe okay. it's better if you don't read it. Those are. Peter. No, no, you, I can't do it. Peter so. Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. That wasn't very good. I wasn't perfect. One more time, one more time. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. One, one more, three Pe more times. <laughs> Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a, oh, did I, I can't do it. <laughs> Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. There we go. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a pack of pick, oh man, that's tough. The peas, man, I can't do the peas. <laughs> oh, wow. Peas can't do you either. Okay, <laughs> go to your next one. What's your next okay. one? Uh, now uh, my brain is frazzled now. Okay, uh. Oh, I just like this one. I've actually never heard this before, but I like it because there's a lot of THs in it. And a lot of uh, foreign people who are learning English, let me say that, a lot of non-native English speakers have trouble with TH. That's been true for a lot of my students, regardless of where they're from, what their native language is. So, the 33 thieves thought that they thrilled the throne throughout Thursday. Wow, I've never right? seen this one. Yeah, me either. But I just thought it was good because the... Remember, TH. So... The 33 thieves thought that they thrilled the throne throughout Thursday. Want to give it a try? Yeah, I'm going to try. The 33 thieves thought that they thrilled the throne throughout Thursday. Hmm. That's a good one. That's a really good one for TH sounds, I think. It's not, it's, I think the consonant sounds, like the hard consonant sounds, like the P sound or the, well, maybe even the W sound a little bit. Like it's easy to say that quickly, but this one's really tough to say quickly, I think, and clearly. The 33 Thieves thought that they throw this one <laughs> It just doesn't come out as smoothly, maybe. S spitting a lot, maybe that's Maybe right. so. Okay, uh, I guess I'll go to my next one. I really have no faith that I'm going to be able to say this at all. This is like the hardest thing that I think I, I was able to find. I'm going to have to read it slowly. The Sixth Sick Sheik's Sixth Sheep's Sick. Yeah. What? Okay. Yeah. The Sixth Sick Sheik's Sixth Sheep's Sick. Yeah. The Sixth Six... Oh, the... <laughs> No, like the second word, you can't even say it. It's really hard. One more time, all right. The, the sixth sick sheep, sixth sheep sick. The oh. sixth, oh. That was good, that was good. That was way better yeah, than Yeah, we'll I just was leave do. it on that one. That, six, yeah, I did it once. The sixth sick sheep, sixth sheep sick. Wow. That's really hard. It's really, I don't think I can say it any faster than that. The sixth sick sheep, sixth, oh. <laughs> oh. I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss of words. I'm speechless. I can't. <laughs> Okay, okay, one more time. Okay. Ready? The sixth sick sheik's sixth sheep's sick. The sixth sick. Ooh. You more got than it. once is too tough. You got it out the one, one time. Times, that was solid. That was solid. I, I give up. I give up. Good, good, good. Okay, what's your next one? My next one is The soldier's shoulder surely hurts. Another one I've actually never heard, but I liked it because everyone knows Sally sells seashells down by the seashore. The S and the SH is confusing. Mm -hmm. And many times in English, like surely, there's no sh, but it makes that that sh sound. So it's a fun one. Yeah. The soldier's shoulder surely hurts. The soldier's shoulder surely hurts. 
Want to give it a try? The soldier's shoulder surely hurts. This is the tough part here for me, anyway. Is this the soldier's shoulder making mm. that sound really clearly? Is that the soldier's shoulder surely hurts? Yeah. Yeah. You make it sound so easy. Wow, professional. Not really. Okay. Uh, on to the last one. This one is really short, actually. It's only two words, but it's tricky. It's really tricky. I can't say this fast. Irish. Rish, wristwatch. <laughs> okay, Irish by itself is fine. Wristwatch is fine. But together, they're really hard to say. Irish, rish, wrist. <laughs> I can't say it. Irish wristwatch. It's uh, really hard. Irish wristwatch. Yeah. It's very slow. Okay, Irish. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's really hard. It doesn't, it seems easier than it is. Yeah. I was saying it, I thought, come on. Okay, I, Irish wristwatch. Irish. <laughs> Irish wristwatch. Irish oh, wristwatch. Oh. Irish wristwatch. Nice. There we go. Okay. Irish wrist. I, <laughs> I can't say this one. Irish wrist. wrist. <laughs> I, can't, I can't try it. This one's hard. This one's really hard for me. But yeah, only two words. It's just it's just that combination of the sh and the r. That's just. I can't. I got nothing on that one. All right. Do you have any more? No, I think that's it. Oh wow, that was a good one. That was really tough. That was really tough. Okay, well, give them a try. Please give them a try. And if you have any tongue twisters, preferably in English, <laughs> please share them with us in the comments. They're great ways to practice your pronunciation, and you can impress your friends if you can do them quickly. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome back to Top Words. Today we're going to talk about 10 job interview questions and a few responses to those job interview questions. So let's go. Tell me a little about yourself. Statement number one is tell me a little about yourself or tell me a little bit about yourself. This is a very common interview introduction question or the first question in an interview. Tell me about yourself is just an open question. Please share or basically introduce yourself. This usually um, means you should share what you studied in college, your work experience, any like personal projects you've tried to do or have successfully done, other experience you think is relevant. So this is an invitation for you to give like a general introduction about yourself. In an example sentence, well, I got my bachelor's degree in biochemistry. How did you hear about the position? How did you hear about the position? How did you hear about the position? This question means how did you learn about this job that you are interviewing for? How did you find this job opening? So how did you hear about the position? Uh, this is where you can explain maybe uh, where you found the information about the job. So you found it on the internet, in the newspaper, you heard from a friend, you were contacted by a recruiter. So there are a few different ways that you can share with your interviewer how you found the position, how you heard about the job. In a sentence, I found an advertisement about the job on the internet. Why are you interested in this position? Next is, why are you interested in the position? Why are you interested in the position? This is your chance to explain why you want this job. Why are you interested in this position? So usually you should not say for the money or because this is a really, I don't know, there are a lot of attractive people at this company. I don't know. You should say something in response to this question about your career goals or maybe something specific about the company that you like or something very specific about the job that uh, is available there and how you feel your skills are a match for that job. So um, explain why you're interested in that position, the reason you decided to apply for that job. In a sentence, I think I'm a good fit for the company and its goals. Why should we hire you? The next interview question is why should we hire you? Why should we hire you? So this is your opportunity to explain why you feel you are the best candidate for the job. So if you have any special qualifications, you have certifications, you have specific experience, you have a specific goal in mind, this is the kind of question you can share that information in response to. Why should we hire you? 
because I can speak six different languages and I know how to create a website in 10 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, if you have some kind of special qualifications, you can share those qualifications in response to this question. In another example sentence, I'm a goal-oriented person who likes to work at a fast pace. What do you consider your strengths and weaknesses? The next question is a common question. What do you consider your strengths and weaknesses? What do you consider your strengths and weaknesses? Or what are your strengths and weaknesses? So strengths means strong points, things you are good at. Weaknesses is your weak points, things you are not very good at. So you, can, you should be honest to a degree, but be careful. So this should be in a professional setting. Keep that in mind. It's a professional setting. If you want to talk about your weaknesses, don't say like, uh, I eat too much chocolate or don't say like, I love sleeping or whatever. Talk about your professional strengths and your professional weaknesses. And also with your weaknesses, it would be a good idea to talk about how you improve those weaknesses or how you uh, work with your team members or work in a company um, to try to reduce the effect of those weaknesses. So for example, I'm very detail oriented, but I often take on too much at one time. Um, so like in my case, that's the case. Like I'm very detail oriented, but I often take on too much. So do too many things at one time. So I could explain, okay, so I'm very detail oriented, but uh, if I'm trying to take on too much, I tr maybe I say I communicate with my coworkers about what should be prioritized and that helps me organize my time better. So when you introduce your weakness, talk about the ways you kind of you try to reduce the effect of that weakness. That can be one technique. So your good points and your bad points in this question. Tell me about a time when you overcame a challenge at work. Some interviewers may ask this question. Tell me about a time when you overcame a challenge at work. So it's not really a question. They're asking you to tell a story. So tell me about a time when you overcame a challenge at work. So they want to hear an example from your professional experience about how you solved a problem. What did you do to solve a problem at work? Uh, they want to know uh, what kind of problem it was and how you approached the problem and the result of that problem. So um, you could say, for example, our company party was scheduled for the day before Christmas, but the restaurant exploded and I had to find a new place to have the party. <laughs> I don't know. That's not, of course, a crazy example. But giving your employer an idea of how you solve problems and maybe the kind of mental state you have when you solve the problems can be helpful in making a hiring decision. So in an example, when I was having trouble communicating with a client, I reached out to a coworker for support. What are your career goals? The next question is, what are your career goals? Your career goals. So not necessarily in this company, but in your career overall. In the interview, it's probably a good idea to include the company uh, where you are currently interviewing in your career goals. Um, but keep in mind, like you should be uh, explaining a goal or you should be sharing a goal that is in line with the company's work. So if your goal is to open a cupcake shop, but you're interviewing for like an IT job where you're going to be like, I don't know, installing Windows 10 on people's computers, maybe this doesn't really match. So make sure that your career goal and the job you're interviewing for align. Those two should be kind of aligned. Uh, it'll help your interviewer and it will help you, I think. So in an example sentence, I want to create a global advertising campaign strategy. So maybe you're interviewing for a marketing job, for example. You could say that's your career goal. I would love to design a global marketing campaign strategy, for example. Where do you see yourself in five years? The next question, a very common one, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in five years? This question means after five years, five years from this point in time, what is your vision for you? What is your vision of yourself professionally? So what do you want to have achieved after five years? So a good tip for this question is to explain where you will be having made contributions to the company where you are interviewing. So if I'm interviewing at Apple 
And Apple says, where do you see yourself in five years, Alicia? And I say, I see myself at Microsoft. Like, that sounds really bad. So try to um, share your, your goals for yourself in a five-year period. But again, try to align them with the company where you're interviewing and explain like how you plan to contribute to the company and develop yourself professionally. That can be a really good way to answer this question. For example, I see myself in a managerial position in this company working on multiple projects for multiple markets. Ooh. Why do you want to work here? The next question is, why do you want to work here? Why do you want to work here? So similar to why are you interested in this position, that one's like, uh, that question is very much about this job in particular. But the question, why do you want to work here, means why do you want to work in this company, like in this place specifically? So share something about the company that you like or share something, some reason the company uh, is attractive to you as a candidate. So maybe it's the location or maybe it's the ability to uh, work overseas or maybe it's an international environment or maybe you can use your English skills. Some reason why you're interested in working at this company specifically. Share that after this question. Uh, so example, um, I think there's a lot to learn and I think there are opportunities for promotion. Do you have any questions for me? Last one. The last question is very common. Do you have any questions for me? Do you have any questions for me? Interviewers will often ask this question at the end of an interview inviting the candidate to ask questions about the company. It is usually a very good idea to prepare some questions for the interviewer. So it's, it's also a good idea to research your company or research the university you're interviewing for before the interview. So if you have questions about the company, company policy, that sort of thing, it's a great chance to ask your interviewer. Generally, however, it's not a good idea to ask specific questions about pay or vacation in the interview as you can be seen as mm, maybe too being too money or too vacation focused, that might come a little later. If you say, what's the salary for this job? <laughs> like, unless it's a situation, unless it's a kind of a close situation that might be too direct a question. Um, but instead, ask some things about the company, ask your interviewer what it's like to work there, what your interviewer thinks is good about working for the company, or maybe what your uh, interviewer thinks the company's planning to do over the next few years. Uh, ask something of your interviewer. So it shows that you are interested in that company and that you want to learn more and participate more with that company. So make sure to have some questions prepared when your interviewer asks, do you have any questions for me? So example question, what do you think is the most rewarding part about working here? So those are 10 job interview questions and a few different ways you can respond to them. So I think those are useful for job interviews, yes, but maybe if you interview for like a university or interview for uh, a scholarship or something, you can use similar responses to similar questions. So if you have any questions or comments, please let us know in the comment section below this video. 10 ways to report speech. Let's go. Say. The first word is say, say as a verb. Say is a very neutral word you can use to report someone's speech, to explain something someone said in the past. So for example, he said the barbecue was canceled. Mm, just a simple neutral report. Tell. The next verb is tell. Tell is used when one person is giving information to another, to tell someone something they did not know before. Don't say, tell me your phone number, that's weird, but like, uh, can you tell me where the station is? Can you tell me where to buy a hamburger? Can you tell me where to pick up my new car? Like, so giving someone information they don't know or or on the other hand, explaining something one way to another person. So don't tell me what I can't do is a very good Lost reference if you've ever watched Lost. Uh, so tell. Another example sentence, my boss told me I was doing a good job. Speak. Uh, the next one is speak, speak. So we use speak when we're talking about uh, language ability, like I speak English, I speak Japanese. We can use speak in the past tense to report something. 
but it usually sounds a little more formal. So like I spoke to my boss about, or I spoke to my parents about, or I spoke to my boyfriend or girlfriend about, blah blah blah. That using speak instead of talked、uh, makes it sound a little bit more formal. So you can use speak, but it's going to sound polite. In a sentence, my colleague spoke with me about an upcoming project. Was like. Okay, the next one,、uh, the next two actually are very, very casual expressions. So when you're speaking with friends and you're kind of talking about a quick, maybe somewhat emotional conversation, you will hear native speakers, especially Americans. Perhaps this is unique somewhat to Americans. Use the phrase "was like," "I was like," "He was like," "She was like." This is a very casual way to report speech, and you'll hear it often. Very, very quickly together.、Uh, so someone will say, "I was like what?" and then she was like, "No," and then I was like, "Yeah." That's the kind of pattern you'll hear it in. Very, very quick ways to report speech, but the subject changes. I was like, he was like, she was like, we were like. This is a way to share what happens quickly. Instead of I said, he said, she said, which might sound a little too formal, we can use I was like, he was like. To do that instead, so this is a really fun one, and if you can use this、uh, naturally, I think that it'll really help you sound more natural too. So in a sentence, and then he was like, "I love that movie." Was all. The next one is also、uh, similar to was like. We have the expression was all. So was all.、Uh, don't worry about all. All does not have the meaning of the whole of something or a complete something. Instead, was all this set phrase is used to report speech. Usually, this one is used when there's some kind of emotional,、uh, emotional aspect to your conversation, or it's a little dramatic, or maybe a little exciting. We use it the same way as was like in that very very quick style of speaking, and then he was like, and I was all, and then she was like, and I was all. We use those together, but I was all has a little more emphasis. I feel I tend to use it when my when I want to express a stronger emotion, and I was all no way, or and I was all what. So <laughs> you can use it for those very like surprised emotions or maybe angry emotions. Was like and was all are both used in very casual situations. So, in a sentence, and I was all, oh my god, me too. Talk. The next word is talk. So, talk, similar to、uh, say, is a fairly neutral verb when reporting speech. You'll use it in a situation where someone is giving new information、uh, to you. Uh, but maybe it's a two-way conversation. So, for example, we talked about blah blah blah、uh, for a topic, or、uh, my boss talked to me about blah blah blah. So maybe new information is being exchanged, but the conversation is two-way. There are multiple participants. With tell, it's like. The nuance is sort of one person is reporting information, giving information. With talked, it's there's an exchange happening there. So keep in mind when you use the word talk, you will say either I I talked to or I talked with someone,、uh, and then you'll usually have a topic. So I talked to my friend about blah blah blah. Uh, I talked to my friend about my new apartment. I talked to my boss about a raise. I talked to my boss. No, I talked to my dog about what dogs do. <laughs> so it, there's some kind of there's some kind of exchange happening there. You'll need to use to or with、uh, when you're referring to the person or entity you're talking to, and you'll use about to refer to the subject. So、uh, you can use this one.、Um, yeah. When you're when you want to discuss exchanges of information, so in a sentence, she talked to me about my family. Mention. Let's go to the next one. The next one is mention. Mention is used when like something is just there's just one small point in a conversation, like just a little side note, or maybe it's not the focus of a conversation, but just something someone says quickly, or there's just a little thing that you hear. Oh, you mentioned something about blah blah blah, or you mentioned that a new project. Like it's it's maybe not the focus of the conversation, but something that you heard a little bit about. 
That's, that's when we use the verb mention. We can also use it in a statement like, please uh, mention any skills you have on a resume. So it, the nuance is sort of like, a, like just a little bit of information uh, is when we use mention. So in a sentence, our manager mentioned upcoming changes at the company. To go on and on. Okay, the next expression is to go on and on. So to go on and on means just to talk for a very long time. So maybe you have a coworker or a friend or a family member that just talks and does not stop talking. Uh, we say to go on and on. That's the expression we use. So in a sentence, the speaker at the seminar was going on and on about the topic. If you really want to emphasize it, you can say it was going on and on and on and on and on. That really emphasizes that the person continues to speak. So if you know somebody um, who does that a lot, you can use this expression to talk about them. According to. Uh, the next expression here is according to. According to is used uh, actually in the news or like to officially report something. So according to sources or according to the police, according to the government official, according to my teacher, according to my mother, these are like direct reports of information and they're direct reports of information from a specific source. So according to the newspaper, my neighborhood has 50,000 amazing ramen shops. That's not true. <laughs> but if I want to, instead of just saying my neighborhood has 50,000 amazing ramen shops, I'm giving a source for that. So according to my newspaper, this is, th this is where I got the information. So this is important to use in news and newspapers and any kind of official documentation. You will see and hear according to in these cases. Ah, in a sentence, according to a witness at the scene, the suspect escaped. Report. Great, so um, the next one is report. So report, similar to according to, we use report in more official situations. So to officially share information, like to report to the police, to report to your teacher, to report to uh, your boss. Sometimes it means to submit documentation, like to, to give someone a written report. Sometimes it's to share information officially, just, just with your voice, to report news or to report an update. Uh, so when you want to give, an, give official information, we'll use the verb report. So in a sentence, sources in the area report that the accident was not serious. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right. 